always been a Dick Van Dyke fan. He had a great show, a series called Diagnosis Murder back in the 1990s. Um, however, today's episode is about real diagnosis murder. In real life, a doctor's medical or clinical diagnosis can actually lead to a conviction, and including a wrongful conviction, for murder or child abuse. And this is most generally the case when you're talking about a shaken baby syndrome case, or in the more modern parlance, it's called abusive head trauma. And we're going to be looking at a particular case today, the Julie Balmer case, where shaken baby was used as a clinical diagnosis that then led to her conviction for first degree child abuse. The theory is that once a, an infant has been injured in this way, that they cannot survive for very long. And so the last caregiver is the one who must have inflicted the injury. And therefore, sometimes the person who brings the child into the emergency room is immediately suspected of having committed child abuse. And that's exactly what happened to Julie Balmer in the story that we're about to talk about. So we've all had a diagnosis in a doctor's office, and many of us have had either a CAT scan or an MRI scan. This is a brain scan from radiopedia.org, which I highly recommend to you if you're into that kind of thing. It's really, really interesting. And what's most interesting about it in this case is that this white area here is actually the sign of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, or CVST, which is a kind of stroke that can occur when there's abusive head trauma in infants, and is also, however, a sign or a, a consequence of a traumatic birth as well. So it can be an accidental thing as well as being something that was the result of the actions of another individual. Therefore, CVST and other signs like it in the brain of a child, of, of, an un, of an infant under the age of one year old, can easily be ambiguous and be, be subject to whatever the qualitative and subjective biases are of the clinician who is examining the images. Uh, and that really made a big difference in the Julie Bomber case. So Julie Bomber, uh, her sister actually was pregnant and had unspecified issues. I don't know what all those involved, but in any case, the uh, uh, baby uh, went through a very difficult delivery at least. So this was in August of 2003. The baby's name was Philip Bomber, uh, born to Julie's sister. And Julie agreed to take care of the baby. Uh, the, the mother actually uh, was given Pitocin as part of the uh, childbirth. And the child was put into the ICU for about a week before being discharged into Julie Balmer's care. And she took care of the child for uh, that, the rest of that time for the next, next uh, uh, several weeks and months. On August 29th, she took the child to the doctor. The, doc the doctor gave the child a clean bill of health. On September 23, she took the child to the doctor and the baby got a clean bill of health, despite having been in the pediatric ICU for a week when he was born. On October 3, and in the days leading up to October 3, uh, she saw that the baby was not doing as well. Um, this was a time when Julie Balmer, by her own account, was the sole provider, care, caregiver, for the child. And as I mentioned, um, when the diagnosis is that there's abuse that occurred, that means that she would be held responsible for that abuse by the doctors. And so, indeed, she went on October 3, being concerned about the child, to take the child to the emergency room. This was in Macomb County, Michigan. So she takes the child to the emergency room on a basis of, of basically three things. The child had poor appetite, he refused to eat, basically the same thing, and was very fussy. And so uh, that gives a picture of a child who is uh, in distress, but not at a, but, but it's still active, right? So in the emergency room, however, their observations were very, very different. They said the child was in coma, was dehydrated, hypoglycemic, was in kidney failure, and was anemic. These were very, very serious symptoms 
they immediately took the child into the pediatric ICU and gave the child surgery for severe brain trauma and what they interpreted as a skull fracture. In other words, this was a child who um, uh, was perhaps abused. There was, uh, there's also another element to this legally that may have entered into some of the discussion, although I don't see it in any of the official documentation here, but it's happened in other cases because state law basically says a parent not only, of course, has the uh, obligation not to abuse their child, obviously, but that the parent also, or caregiver, has the responsibility to make sure that the child gets proper medical treatment. And so a parent who fails to give a child proper medical treatment may be liable for a form of child abuse as well. Not what is called first degree child abuse in most states, but some lesser degree of child abuse. And so this also could have been implicated based on the fact that Julie Bomber's interpretation of where the child was at appears to have been a little bit different or very significantly different from what the emergency room in a hospital's view of where the child's uh, health was at. And so that by itself, raised suspicions, I'm sure, within the hospital that she was not doing a good job taking care of this child. The chief of pediatric neuro neurosurgery at the uh, hospital was a man by the name of Stephen Ham, and he uh, concluded, based on the symptomology and other diagnostics that they, that they took, that the injuries to the baby had occurred, that, were, that they were non-accidental, and they occurred 12 to 24 hours before he had examined the child. And that these injuries were best explained by blunt force trauma and shaking. And that is that the, the, the child was showing what appeared to be a fracture in the skull. Uh, there was also a radiologist who was very influential in this case. Her name was Dr. Christy Baker. This is actually an artificial intelligence image of a female uh, pediatrician, not a picture of Dr. Baker. The radiologist, Dr. Baker, she concluded very similarly that the injuries could not have been five or six days old. So it was during the period when Julie Balmer was definitely the sole caregiver for Philip Balmer. And she further opined that the injuries she saw in the brain scans, and they did both a CAT scan and an MRI scan, had occurred 24 to 48 hours before the scans had taken place, or no, more than 24 to 48 hours before the scans had taken place. So that was obviously you know, quite, quite a substantial allegation on her part. The child survived, but was severely disabled. I don't know whether the child lives to this day, but the child was severely disabled for life based on what had happened to that point uh, in uh, whether it was in Julie Balmer's care or in the hospital's care. So you've heard me discuss several terms here, and I've used them interchangeably. In part, that's because of how this diagnosis has changed over the years with respect to the language used. So originally, back many, many years ago, like when Dick Van Dyke was doing diagnosis murder, it was called almost exclusively shaken baby syndrome. It was an element, a triad of symptoms, I'll get to that in a second, what that was, that implied or was diagnostically considered to imply that a baby under the age of one usually had been shaken so violently that it had caused brain damage. Uh, that diagnostic set because of its ambiguity, has now been replaced by this more modern term called abusive head trauma. And so that can be inclusive of shaking, it can be inclusive of other kinds of trauma, such as impact trauma and things like that, that could occur to the child. And sometimes, as in this case, it's even more generically talked about. So non-accidental trauma associated with shaking is another set of language that is often used. The triad is basically three things, retinal bleeding, subdural hematoma and, hematoma, and brain swelling. Unfortunately for the folks who are trying to determine whether a child has been abused, and obviously chi children do get abused, and so we don't want to just dismiss any concerns out of hand, but these same symptoms can be seen in a child who experiences head trauma as part of a difficult birth. And it's 
fairly clear that in this case, the child had re had gone through a difficult enough birth so that some of these symptoms would have been uh, you know, inflicted upon the child. We really don't know the extent to which, and I don't think we ever will know the extent to which the, these were birth injuries. However, it, the fact of the matter is that it's ambiguous. It's, it's really very difficult to be able to divide these two things diagnostically. In any case, Dr. Baker on the 17th of December sent a letter to the Macomb County Sheriff's Department. And in that letter, she said, and this is a quote from the letter, non-accidental head trauma involving a shaking episode, as well as a striking of the head against a solid flat surface had occurred with Philip Balmer. Further, and this was uh, uh, very, very important to the case later on, this is a particularly devastating injury to a baby because the large and relatively heavy head is so poorly supported by the weak neck muscles such that the to and fro shaking injury is compounded by a rotational force generated intracranially. And so what this did long term was it showed it as, a, as kind of an exacerbating factor to abuse if it had occurred. And so when Julia Bomber was eventually convicted of abusing her nephew, the judge took this statement into account to say, well, this was a particularly heinous kind of abuse. And so um, the judge sentenced uh, Julie Balmer to 10 to 15 years in prison because even though that exceeded the sentencing guidelines in Michigan because of the severity of the injuries as they were reported by the hospital. The other thing that's interesting, there are a couple other interesting things here. One is like if, if you've ever been involved uh, with a friend or family member who has had a concussion, say in a traffic accident, what they'll say is that if there is just translational injury, so if, if the sloshing basically of the brain inside the skull is just uh, responding to translational forces, or if it is just rotational forces, then that doesn't cause nearly as much damage as when the two are combined. And that's what one of the things that Dr. Baker is saying here is that the child experienced both translational forces and rotational forces that as part of this alleged abuse. The other thing that's interesting here is the comment about weak neck muscles. There's actually been research. Obviously, one of the problems here is that you don't do empirical research on babies, right? This was that would be hor horrific. Um, however, there's been research that attempts to use things like finite element analysis and other kinds of mathematical models to determine how this might uh, happen in a real world setting. One of the things that, that those models appear to indicate is that for a young baby, yes, they have a large head and, so, and, and, and they have a forming brain and so they are susceptible to brain injury, but they do have a weak neck. And the mathematical models suggest that if you enter a baby through shaking enough to cause this kind of brain damage, that you will also injure the neck. That there should be, if you will, a quadrille, what, what is a, a, instead of a triad, what's a quadrat? I don't know. Uh, uh, there should be four elements of shaken baby syndrome if there were such a thing being diagnosed because you should see neck injuries for the baby because babies have relatively weak necks. And so the math says, you know, you should see neck injuries. Um, and it's part of why babies would be susceptible to shaken baby syndrome. Um, the extent to which that is now recognized in the medical community appears to be still uh, ambiguous, to say the least. I, it does not appear that that's yet a consensus within the medical community in the diagnosis of shaken baby syndrome. However, it is true, and I'll credit Deborah Turkheimer, who's generally credited with this idea, that once all these things have been concluded by people like Dr. Ham and Dr. Baker, who are respected medical professionals in their field, that that clinical diagnosis is basically a medical diagnosis of, of, of murder. Uh, it, is, it is not just a clinical diagnosis. And even though it's done in a clinical setting, and so sometimes what you get is uh, when you have people who are in a medical profession and they make a diagnosis of this sort, they say, well, I'm just a clinician, right? I, I really, I'm not, I'm not the judge and jury of whether the criminal justice system uses 
my conclusions or not is really none of my concern. And uh, however, the, the, the problem with that is, is that the criminal justice system is known to use these clinical judgment. And how you might opine on a forensic science matter in a court, it's gonna be very different from how you might do things clinically. In a clinical setting, you wanna be able to consider the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario in this kind of a case is that the child was abused and you wanna be able to treat the child aggressively to help the child uh, recover from that abuse. Uh, within a forensic science and courtroom setting, you wanna be a little bit more circumspect. The, the considerations with respect to the conclusions you might draw are very, very different. And the uncertainties and limitations as you might express them are very, very different. Now, you know, it isn't always cut and dry between the two, but there's no question there's a difference between clinical judgment and forensic science judgment. Nonetheless, in this particular case, it was considered not a difficult case. That is, uh, according to the medical professionals and then eventually to the prosecutors of the case, there really wasn't uh, a whole lot of difficulty in determining that this was abuse and prosecuting Julie Bomber for it. She also made a mistake that's very common among people who are naive to the justice system. And that is that she didn't know, you know, kind of how to protect herself and that kind of thing. So she consented to a polygraph. Now, as it turns out, polygraph results aren't admissible in court in almost any state in the United States. However, there's a subtlety to it that most people don't appreciate. What it means to say it's not admissible is to say the, polygraph, the polygrapher can't come into court and say, well, I think the uh, defendant was lying about this, or I think the defendant was truthful about that. The, the polygrapher can't come in and say that. However, anything that is said by the individual during the polygraph is fully admissible in court. And Julie Balmer actually signed a release form as part of the preparation for the polygraph saying as much. And that basically signed her rights away. Now, she did not confess to abusing the child as part of the polygraph. However, she made things like these incriminating statements, like the fact that Philip was in her care in those days leading up to the emergency room visit. That was an extremely incriminating statement for somebody who was involved in a case in, uh, of this kind of abusive head trauma of, or non-accidental trauma involving shaking. Uh, this uh, kind of statement she made in, on the polygraph was admissible and was admitted in court and wound up being a major part of why she was convicted for what was first degree uh, child abuse. Uh, she did have one expert that came in, Dr. Janice Opaven, who is a forensic pathologist who specializes in pediatric medicine. And she called into question the interpretation. She said she disagreed with the interpretation, but the court did not allow her to present an alternative interpretation of the radiological scans. So basically, it almost in my view, it almost reinforced the, I, the perception of guilt. Because if you say, well, I don't like your interpretation, and then you're challenged and say, well, what's your interpretation? And you aren't even able to give an answer, right? She basically was not allowed to give an answer because she wasn't a radiologist. She wasn't, that wasn't her specialty, was, was imaging of this type. And therefore, she was just like, well, I don't have an answer to that. Well, if you object to somebody else's view, but you don't have uh, an alternative that, hypothesis that you can put forward, then you really, in some respects, uh, whether you want to or not, you've undermined the, the case. And so uh, Dr. Opaven did testify on Julie Bomber's behalf, but it was ineffective in challenging the overall story of the case. The other part of it is that the defense attorney really didn't want to or didn't make it a priority to challenge the clinical diagnosis. Instead, the defense attorney chose to say, well, maybe somebody else had committed the abuse. Uh, because there had been other caregivers during those two months uh, uh, prior to the emergency room visit for Philip Balmer. The problem with that, of course, was that Julie had been uh, in charge. Uh, she, she had been the, the caregiver, sole caregiver for Philip for almost a week there before the ER visit. And therefore, that defense was extremely weak. And uh, But you can see how a defense attorney who's not a medical professional it's very hard for them to conceptualize the idea that they're going to do a, a very complex defense 
based on the ambiguity of medical interpretations, they're much more uh, capable of, of saying, well, you know, it was somebody else who did it. That's a, that's a much more straightforward defense for an attorney to put together something that's much more familiar to them. I, whether that's why the attorney went in that direction or not, I can't say. I do know that on the 29th of September, 2005, roughly two years after the uh, emergency room visit, uh, Julie was convicted of first degree child abuse and sentenced, as I mentioned before, to 10 to 15 years in prison. And that would have been the end of the story. She was visited by this gentleman in prison, uh, uh, Dr. Charles Lagosi, who was a Canadian lawyer um, who had been uh, active in, in uh, uh, faith work within uh, prison ministries. And so when she, when she told him about her case, he decided, well, let's look into it. Let's take some of the medical work and let's bring in some new experts. And so he brought in several of them. For example, Dr. Patrick Barnes of Stanford Medicine, who said, in fact, that he interpreted these scans as CVST, as cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, as I was mentioning before. And CVST uh, is uh, something that can happen with newborns. It's actually very, very rare, but it is something that if it, if it, when it happens, it's most common among newborns. Also, Dr. Michael, and I'm going to butcher this name, I'm terribly sorry, Dr. Michael Krasnitskutsky of Stanford and Tripler, Tripler Army Medical Center also came and said, this it looks like CVST, it looks like an infant stroke, which is what CVST basically is. Normally, normal strokes are arterial, so they're, they're uh, blood clots or something of that nature that, that uh, deprives the brain of oxygenated blood. A CVST is the other way around. It's the veins that drain the brain that then uh, get clogged up or uh, fail in some way in their ability to drain the blood out of the brain. And that also basically backs blood up into the drain, uh, blood into the brain and can cause a form of stroke called CVST. He said CVST had been misinterpreted as a hemorrhage. Uh, Dr. James Ferris, a colleague of Dr. Krasnikutsky uh, from uh, the University of Maryland in Georgetown, was an imaging specialist, said the signs of hemorrhage from birth are diagnostic of CVST. Uh, so in other words, um, what they, they also were fetal monitoring strips that they were able to pull from the records of Philip Balmer's birth. Fetal monitoring strips are, uh, and if you've ever um, had a child or you've been in a delivery room with a mother who was giving birth, you can, you'll can you see this, where they, they basically record heart rate and things of that nature for the baby uh, before, during, and after birth as well as they possibly can. And those are fetal monitoring strips. And those fetal monitoring strips tell you an awful lot about the health of the child during the birth. And indeed, as these experts were saying, there was a difficult enough birth to conclude that th there was a reasonable chance that CVST had occurred with Philip Balmer during, during the birth. And in other words, it's very sad that he had this outcome, but it's very possible that Julie Balmer did the best she possibly could have done. Right. So, she, you know, one of the things I'm sure people feel in these situations is incredible guilt for not being able to help and save this poor child, this poor, helpless child. In fact, uh, uh, because the CVST was not diagnosed uh, at the time of birth, it may not have been possible for her to do anything to have to have to have helped Philip. Um, and, and because he just wasn't being properly diagnosed. Because, and because the signs are just difficult. That's more difficult than if you have an arterial stroke and things of that nature. And even Dr. Norman Guthkelch. So Dr. Guthkelch was, uh, in some respects, a new, the developer of shaken baby syndrome. He had uh, uh, started doing research back in the 1950s, had first published on this in, as early as 1953. Uh, he is still alive, as far as I know. He was in his late 90s, the last quotes I saw from him on this topic, but even he came in and, and weighed in and said, whoa, 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 you know, shaken baby syndrome has been very much abused in the, in the, in the uh, criminal justice community, um, um, way misinterpreted. Uh, it isn't like uh, there isn't such thing. And he's like, I, he says that he 
push the idea of shaken baby syndrome because he wanted parents and caregivers to understand that shaking a baby can injure that child. And, and that kind of medical input was crucial to saving children from this awful fate of having uh, uh, permanent brain damage because of being shaken. That doesn't justify making ambiguous interpretations of shaken baby syndrome or abusive head trauma when the interpretations are really ambiguous and subjective. He feels like in this case that it was not shaken baby, that it was CVST that had occurred. So this is the uh, scan again from Radiopedia. Uh, and, and showing uh, the idea of the CVST signs, especially all of all this white area basically is uh, damage from the fact that the blood is, is backing up into the brain. And this is, although the contrast is different in the lower image uh, than, the, than in the top image, but I'm just giving you an idea that the same areas of the brain can get involved. The bottom image also from radiopedia.org is actually signs of brain damage from a uh, case where there was confirmed abuse, where we know that the child was abused. And so at the very minimum, I'm, and I'm, we're not here to, to, to consider all the ins and outs of brain imaging and interpretation, but at the very minimum, the areas of the brain which are uh, affected by abusive head trauma, by birth trauma, and by CVST very much overlap. And the science can easily be misinterpreted or be, as I say, ambiguous. And so uh, uh, on the basis of all these experts, Julie Balmer, uh, her conviction was overturned by the appeals court and a second trial occurred. And so you again had experts on both sides of it. You had the prosecution experts and the defense experts. And basically from the side of the prosecution experts, this is not a, um, a, a foolish kind of interpretation. Uh, abusive head trauma is, is recognized by the American Academy of Pediatrics. They have a great deal of work that they've done documenting how to diagnose and treat abusive head trauma. Uh, they talk about the uh, triad of symptoms. They talk about other clinical diagnostics that may be used to elucidate the issue. And one can easily point out that, that the medical community generally supports the idea that abusive head trauma occurs with infants and can be diagnosed and, and treated if found in time. And even though there is an element of researchers in the defense bar who have heavily criticized the, the way in which abusive head trauma has been used in court. So on the side of the defense, there is this idea of CVST and with good and bad. So see, I said CVST is rare. So, for example, five people in a million each year. So not very many, just a few hundred in the United States, for example, in a year uh, of people would have a positive diagnosis saying this person had CVST. And the risk is greatest in new newborns, especially in that first month or so after birth when there's been birth trauma. It's interesting that the one area elsewise where there has been an incidence is actually uh, associated with the mRNA vaccines. One of the M mRNA vaccines was actually that had their emergency use authorization revoked in 2021 for, I think it was no more than a week or so, because there was an incidence among young women who were showing CVST after they had taken the vaccination. The problem being, of course, is this figure here. It doesn't take many uh, uh, people to have that symptom for it to be outside of the norm. And so the question then is, if you have um, 10 women um, who get CVST, who got the vaccine, well, you know, you might have 10 million who, have, who had gotten the vaccine. And so are you really seeing something that is statistically significant or not? It doesn't take much to be beyond five people in a million that's a really, really difficult kind of detection threshold. And so they wound up restoring the mRNA's uh, emergency use uh, authorization. I've forgotten which one it was, whether it was um, Pfizer or Moderna, but it was one of them that was withdrawn because of the CVST issue. Just as an aside, that's really just a matter of, of, of interest to, to tell you how, how kind of rare this is and what an unusual kind of diagnosis this is. However, as I mentioned, the fetal monitoring strips 
did support this interpretation. So there's no question that Philip Balmer's birth uh, uh, could easily be associated with CVST and the imaging could easily be associated with CVST. And so all these doctors, including some of the ones who had been uh, on the other side of things in the first trial, came into court, testified on behalf of Julie Balmer. So in the first trial, all the experts pretty much were arrayed against her, except for that one, that Dr. Alphaven, Alphaven, who was very much um, uh, hamstrung by the court with respect to what she could say. In trial two was the other way around. There were uh, the prosecution doctors, especially those two um, that, that had opined from the get-go about their interpretation of um, shaken baby syndrome or non-accidental trauma. And there were all these other experts, very almost world-renowned experts, uh, arrayed on her side saying, no, we think it's CVST. And she actually uh, got uh, a very, very quick acquittal from the jury. And, and, and there's a lot to be said about that. Uh, but, let's, but, but before we get to that aspect, I just want to kind of lay out some ideas here that are important. One, that from a, from a big expert errors perspective, which is kind of what the channel's about, um, doctors rely on the context to make clinical decisions, and they don't change that approach when they testify as expert witnesses. So this has been a big issue, right? Should a forensic scientist know about context? Because the case context may bias them and may make them make a, a different decision than what is based on the science alone. But a clinical doctor does the same thing. In fact, they dive into the context in order to be able to understand what is going on more clearly. And they could easily be influenced by the context and decide that that's appropriate. Uh, and that's, I don't know whether that's something that can be controlled. Nonetheless, it can create a certain kind of tunnel vision. How much, we, and we don't know, how much did the, the doctors consider the child's case history by the time they had made the decision that the child had been abused? We, we really don't know. And the other extent, once somebody, once the first person had said, well, we think this looks like abuse. And remember, I said that even this idea that a, a parent or caregiver hadn't, given, hadn't brought the child to the hospital quickly enough could be interpreted as being a form of abuse under the legal presumptions. And so they very quickly could have come to the, some conclusion that this was a caregiver who wasn't doing right by the child. And once they went down that path initially, then the rest could have cascaded from there to say, well, you know, well, you know, that that was the original diagnosis. And so they just just build on that original diagnosis with everything else that they see and and assume that everything else they see is supportive of it. That's called continuation bias. They they have a particular hypothesis and they continue to a hold to that hypothesis and try to fit whatever facts come in into that hypothesis, even if those facts may even be contradictory. They, uh, there's, a, there's a whole set of ideas where people of all sorts, not just clinical doctors, but you know, we ignore things that we don't want to hear, you know, we or we hear them as if they're supporting what we like versus versus otherwise. This is a really serious issue for everybody. It's just part of human nature. And if they had a confirmation bias, was there a monoculture that prevented effective debate about the various possibilities? Um, uh, in other words, uh, you know, the hospital, once, they, once people had said, well, we think this is abuse, was there room for somebody to object? If somebody said, oh, I don't think so, was there oxygen in the room, basically, to allow them to say, I don't believe so? And once the idea of CVST was raised, by all the folks, all the other experts who had said, well, we, we think it's CVST. How do they react to that? Did they react defensively? Did they go back and reassess? Uh, don't, don't know, but it's very important to be able to do that. So one of the uh, articles that I have referenced in the description that are, is really interesting from, and it's Dr. Berg, uh, Rachel, I don't know whether it's actually a PhD, uh, Rachel Berg, but Rachel Berg is a, a researcher who's looked at this issue and talked about the Julie Bomber case, but also talked about it from the perspective of maybe there should be review panels that the court can call on to review things like shaken baby cases so that you can have an independent panel 
that looks at all the data just from the from de novo and say their view on whether this was shaken baby or something else and kind of what the considerations are for the court. Basically, be an expert for the court because and this is it's clearly the case that the, the trial court is a terrible place to actually resolve these issues. I don't care if you're, you know, what your view is about the legal system or whatever, but there's no question a trial court is a terrible way to resolve whether this clinical diagnosis was correct in the Julie Bomber case or not. And at the very minimum, you would hope that the hospitals that get involved in this would have something like a devil's advocate review, at least some way of uh, of, of reviewing these from a critical perspective, a skeptical perspective, so that uh, there's a chance for uh, the continuation bias to be at least challenged by somebody who says, well, I, I'm, I, I don't, I, I'm going to take the role of somebody who's a skeptic about this to make you be able to justify it fully. So um, that's an interesting, interesting thing. So if you're interested in this issue, I, I encourage you to look at Rachel Berg's article on it. The other issue is that this is not just a forensic problem. We know, because there's a lot of research now on this, that radiologists actually can be severely affected by contextual bias. Some hospitals and medical facilities actually do a pretty good job here. They're moving toward uh, shielding radiologists from contextual information for this very reason. And so the, was this radiologist? Uh, influenced by the contextual information, or even by my side bias. It's very possible both the defense people and the prosecution people could have been affected by my side bias. Like once it was decided, well, I'm I'm being hired by the defense and I'm gonna see CVST, right? Because uh, you, you know, you're just, you just, you, you get into a mode where my side says that it's CVST. And so I'm going to kind of see things that way. Well, it's, I'm not saying that's a conscious thing. It's just human nature that you have a tendency to, to advocate on behalf of the people who are kind of in your tribe, really. And that may have been, of course, the, the case among the prosecution folks who are working in the hospital as well. So final thoughts, I, I, and, I, and I, I, I don't mean to be a little bit too uh, difficult uh, in this regard, but we don't know what happened to baby Philip. OK, um, we don't know whether the injuries that were observed in the emergency room that day on October 3rd and, and following were the result of the birth or the result of abuse. We just don't. And I'm not casting aspersions against Julie Bomber when I say that. All I'm saying is that we just don't have enough objective data. And that's why it was appropriate for the jury to acquit her. There was reasonable doubt about the interpretation to be able to say, well, how can you uh, convict somebody in a court of law beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, of a first degree child abuse in a case like this? And so I absolutely agree with the jury acquittal. Uh, however, we have a bigger problem in the sense that sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes we just don't have enough information and we need to be willing to accept that. And when experts especially have a hard time accepting that in their field, Right. It's like, I want to believe I but you have to be your own biggest skeptic. Right. <laughs> you have to be your own biggest skeptic um, and understand sometimes the data doesn't give you enough basis to say definitively one way or the other that this is what happened. And this is definitely a case here. Now, Julie Bomber did get a compensation of two hundred and four thousand three hundred eighty nine dollars eventually from the state of Michigan in 2019. Um, eventually, the Michigan passed a law to compensate the wrongfully convicted. It took them quite a while, but they did wind up passing that into law. So that is a, a, something that she got. And I'll tell you personally, I, I uh, just in terms of my impression of, of, of Ms. Balmer, I don't believe that she was anything other than the most honest caregiver and, and best caregiver she could possibly be. I don't think she abused her nephew at all, but that's just my personal view. That has nothing to do with if, if I were a radiologist, how I would interpret the, the x-rays or whatever whatever other kind of diagnostics that there, that there were. So it's an interesting question, uh, and I'll leave that for your homework, as it were. I appreciate you listening today. A really interesting set, a really interesting case, uh, this really interesting set of problems that are incurred by it. If you liked what you saw today, please like, share, and subscribe. Please visit 
my website, experterrors.org, and support my work by uh, uh, reading my research work or my textbook on the subject of wrongful convictions. Thank you so much for your time and your support for my work.